Our opening prayer this morning, Fred Hillman is going to lead our minds in prayer. And Lord's Supper, Barry Root is going to lead our minds in some thoughts for the Lord's Supper. And then our lesson this morning, Jody and Melissa are with us. They're here uh, with Steve, I believe. And they're here to, I say finish or help, Darlene get uh, set up and moved to Vancouver where her sister is at. And so they're with us, and Jody volunteered to uh, bring us our lesson this morning. And so Jody will be delivering the sermon at the appropriate time. And then Chris Huntley is going to be leading our closing prayer this morning. So with that, let us enter into our worship, and we're going to do so with prayer. Uh, Brother Fred Hillman is going to lead us in prayer at this time. Fred? Pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, holy and reverent is your name. We come to you this morning thanking you for this building that we can come together and worship you. We thank you, Father, that uh, all, that, all those who uh, are able to show up or uh, come to the building, and we, we pray for those who have to stay home because of illness or some other reason. And we thank you that uh, your son has come to earth and gave his life so that we can come and see you. And we thank you that uh, all this can happen at any time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we take the Lord's Supper together, let's sing just for today. Just a little reminder concerning your, your top. There is a plastic lid on top. 
that you have to carefully pull away and then partake of the bread. And then secondly, when we're at the appropriate time, tear the second layer off to partake of the fruit of the vine. Hopefully I don't run out of any oxygen <laughs> as, I, as I speak, and this keeps sucking into my faith. The Lord's Supper. At times, I'm sure with others too, I, when I'm about to partake of the Lord's Supper, when I come to prepare my mind to partake of the Lord's Supper, I often turn to Proverbs 25, 20, verse 5, that helps me not make it routine. It's a, it's a challenge as we partake as Christians every, every first day of the week, according to Acts, the 20th chapter, verse 7. There's a possibility that we sometimes look at it as routine. And it's, it's not all routine. So in Proverbs, the 20th chapter, it says this. Um, Counsel of a good heart of a man is like deep waters, but a man of understanding draws it out. Have you ever been to deep waters in the scriptures? where you have to draw out the meaning and understand what we're doing. In 1 Peter, which we're studying on Tuesday night, which we'll be studying on Wednesday night, uh, we talked last week in chapter 2 about our influence that we have on others. Just as we came together, this morning upon the first day of the week to worship God in spirit and truth. We have influence and we are noticed. People notice. And just as we raise our voices in song, people notice that too. Or as we prostrate ourselves in prayer to the holy God, it's noticed. And it is no different as we gather around this table and we take our minds back to that time in which Christ was nailed to the cross. And that we discern the unleavened bread that represents his body and the fruit of the vine which represents the blood of the covenant. That is also noticed. What we try to do before the Lord's Supper is prepare our minds or at least bring verses that would prepare our minds to put us in deep thought, to go to deep waters, if you will. You just think back, some of you may be thinking of Psalms, the 22nd chapter. Others may be thinking of Philippians 2, in verse 8 and 9, where it says, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Or Romans 5, where he demonstrates his love to us. Or in Hebrews 9, where the contrast between the sacrifices of the Old Testament versus the sacrifice of Christ. Our minds go back to that time. One thing we need to be impressed with is that as we go through God's word from one end to another, the death of Christ is brought up. It is a common thread throughout the scriptures and it brings us back to the Lord's Supper and what it means. In Matthew 26, where the Lord's Supper is instituted, just before he is arrested, he is put on trial, and he's hung on a tree. 
He takes a moment. He doesn't have a lot of time. They're going to sing a song and shortly go to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he looks down over the mountain onto Jerusalem, they're about to come to arrest him. And he has, the, he has very little time to instruct his disciples at that time of what is going to happen. And what that should really bring to our minds is the realization of the value and the significance of what we are doing right now. In 26, when I think of it, I think of what just happened in John 13, one through one. Right after the Lord's Supper is instituted, Jesus takes up a towel and he washes the disciples' feet. And my mind directly goes to Isaiah 53. It goes to Isaiah 53 to try to get my mind of that partaking of the bread that represents his body and the, and the cup, fruit of the vine which represents the blood of the covenant. And, in, in a, and please, as I read this, listen carefully. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of a harsh ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of man, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom man hideth their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he has borne. In our sorrows, he has carried. And yet we ourselves esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, scourging we are healed, and all of us are like sheep that have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. And like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due, his grave was a sign with wicked man, and yet, he was, a rich, he, he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, put him to grief. If he would re render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his off offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. 
and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and, with, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sins of many and intercedes for the transgressors. There we go. Let us pray. Our most dear Heavenly Father, we approach you at this time, giving thanks for your Son and for this, for the sacrifice in which he did. As we partake of this bread, which represents his body, Lord, help us discern this. Help our minds go back to that time and discern what is true. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. be compliant. Let us continue our prayer. Our most dear Heavenly Father, again we approach you, giving thanks for this fruit of the vine which represents thy son's blood of the covenant. Help us partake of this in a manner well pleasing in your sight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. After the sermon this morning, we'll sing number 115, Healing in Its Wings. And before the sermon, let's sing Alleluia, Lord, together. And of me, Alleluia, Lord, Alleluia. dark world below in the land of the fallen where her dreams all fade at the ending of life's day there is hope there is peace <clears throat> one who is the true and living way Alleluia, Lord, we have seen your glory, the exalted Son, in whose name we pray. Alleluia, Lord, by your grace and mercy, lead us safely home to live with you one day. Alleluia, Lord, Alleluia, Lord. In this veiled realm below, in the land of the sightless, where her truth lies hidden beneath the heart of stone, there is light for your path if you walk in the brightness of the one who guides us from his heavenly home. 
Alleluia, Lord, we have seen your glory, the exalted Son, in whose name we pray. Alleluia, Lord, by your grace and mercy, lead us safely home to live with you one day. Alleluia, Lord. Alleluia, Well, good morning. Well, let's, we've, we tried this for a while, as I recall. Uh, let's try it again. Good morning. Oh, that's so much better. And good morning to those who are joining us online. We really appreciate you being here. And it's always a thrill for us to be back, uh, Melissa and myself. And, uh, you know, she grew up here, and this truly feels like home for her. And, and, uh, and then me... Working with this church so many years ago, it's just always a uh, it's just always a pleasure to come back, get to be back at Market Street. Uh, this has certainly been a strange year, um, no question about that. Fear has gripped the hearts of so many. Um, we have some that I know who are almost afraid to go out and get the mail, just to walk outside. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, we have conspiracy theorists who believe it's all made up and uh, there's nothing to all of this. But certainly there is no doubt that everyone's lives has been upended by uh, all of this that's going on the past several months uh, worldwide. And um, we had a booming economy and much of that is tanked. Uh, joblessness that was so good is now... Uh, course rose on that and in case you didn't know there's an election that's going to happen in a few days uh, and so as the people of God we, we we face challenges and difficulties all along and uh, I think a time like this uh, makes me consider and wanted to suggest for you today is, is how to pray in a time of crisis um, we just completed a series of six lessons uh, in, in Ocala where we're at and uh, talked about prayer. And one of the things we started out with is that none of us are professional prayers. Uh, this, none of us can say, well, I, I got this thing. I don't have any challenges. Prayer is just something that uh, we all need to grow in. We all need to improve in, that we all can learn more. We all can, can do better. And so we talked about several things in the, over the course of several weeks. But but I ended with this lesson on how to pray in a time of crisis because uh, we all face crises in our lives from time to time. And uh, it may be that we're thinking about the pandemic right now. It may be that uh, something else has come more personal to you, a, a phone call that you get in the middle of the night or whatever the case may be. All of us face challenges. All of us face crises and trials and, and ups and downs in our lives. So how do we handle that? And if we're going to be the people of God, how do we pray in a time of crisis? Now, I don't think you should wait till a crisis comes to pray. I don't think that's the answer, but it is certainly applicable. It's certainly true and right to pray when there is a crisis. And, and so how do we do that? I want to suggest to you a passage back in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to look at, if you have your Bibles, you care to turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. Not a, not a book we often go to or talk about a whole lot. The Chronicles uh, can be somewhat tedious at times. And to go through that and to find uh, this king, it becomes confusing sometimes uh, of the switching between kings and kingdoms. Um, and, and so I want to look at a passage with you. And I want to recommend this as a pattern. I think it's a, it's a great pattern for us to follow when there is a moment of crisis, when there is a challenge that attacks us or, or falls in our lap that just seems to be an overwhelming crisis. And in 2 Chronicles chapter, 22, or chapter 20, let me give you a little bit of a background for this. First of all, Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. 
I, I just like that name, first of all, Jehoshaphat. It's kind of fun to say. Uh, so Jehoshaphat's the king of Judah. He has just been appointed after the death of his father, Asa. And uh, Jehoshaphat comes on the scene, and he does, he begins in a very good way. He strengthens Judah. He uh, doesn't worship the idols. He listens to and, and attempts to follow the voice of the Lord. And so Jehoshaphat, you kind of feel like he comes on the scene of, of good. We're, we're, we're going to have a good king. Everything's going to go great. Everything's going to just go exceptionally well as he comes onto the scene. But he foolishly makes an alliance with Ahab and has his son marry Ahab's daughter. And Jehoshaphat has this roller coaster ride in his life spiritually. That, that he does some things that are brilliant and, and they are amazing for us and, and something that is exemplary that we can follow after. And yet, as is often the case with so many, he has moments of just sheer foolishness where he turns his back on God or turns away from God and, and the kingdom is this up and down roller coaster that's back and forth and up and down. But I want to look at this one such moment in Second Chronicles chapter 20 that was a moment of brilliance. And... Jehoshaphat has just been appointed to, the, to be the king. In the previous chapter, we learned that he's kind of setting up shop. And he does what, what our elected officials do when they get into positions of power, that they, they appoint their cabinet or their judges and rules and, and put different people in position and place. And, and that's what's in 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Jehoshaphat's just kind of setting up house. He's getting it all ready to go. Everything seems to be going along just fine. And then look at chapter 20, beginning of verse 1. It says, after this, that is, after Jehoshaphat's done this work of setting these things up, after this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Minuites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from the Dead Sea. They're already at Hazazon. Tamar, that's another name for En Gedi. Now, I just want you to try to put yourself into his place, into his position. Here is Jehoshaphat. You are the leader. You've just been appointed into position. Everything just kind of getting off the ground. It's beginning to work out. You're setting up shop. Everything's going along fine. And then you get this knock on the door. In essence, it says, we want to tell you that the enemies, these perennial enemies of Judah, the Moabites and the Ammonites, they're on their way to come. Not to congratulate you, not to give you a gift and to tell you that they're glad you're the king, but they are coming to attack you. They're coming to, to come as an enemy against you to attack you at this, at this particular time. Now imagine Jehoshaphat, how he feels, first of all. Just be up one moment, everything's going well, and down the next moment. But I think there's a lesson, first of all, right away from this. Isn't that how crises come? Crises come when we least expect it. Everything seems to be going along fine, and then the phone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning. You didn't expect that. You weren't planning on that. You hadn't prepared for that, and that's how a crisis comes. Everything just kind of seems to be going along, and then the bottom falls out, and we don't know what to do. A crisis has struck. You know, if we could plan on crises, that would be really nice. If we, if we could plan on, okay, next Tuesday, a crisis is coming. So I need to get myself ready. Okay? I, I need to get myself set. Just think back, if you will, one calendar year from today. Or you, can even, you don't even go back that far. Go back to January 1st of this year. Can, which one of you were imagining and maybe even designing what face mask you were going to wear today? Yeah, that wasn't on your thought. That was nowhere on your radar. The idea that you're going to be wearing a face mask. The idea that, that you're going to have to, you know, we probably all would have bought stock in hand sanitizer companies. I mean, we'd have been doing well now if we'd known a year ago, nine, ten months ago, what was going to happen. We'd be all prepared. We'd all be ready for it. But a crisis doesn't announce itself. It doesn't prepare you for, oh, get ready because it might be coming or it is coming. Jehoshaphat, everything's going along fine, and then boom, you get the news. 
The enemies are coming to attack you. So what is Jehoshaphat going to do? Look at verse 3. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news. It's not that Je Jehoshaphat said, okay, I can handle this. I've got my army. I've got my counselors. I've got my generals. Jehoshaphat is terrified by this news. He begs of the Lord for guidance. He also orders everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all over towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. So the very first thing that Jehoshaphat does, and that's our second point really to get out of this, is that what you and I need to do and recognize in a moment of crisis that prayer and God is the first place to go. Prayer is not a last resort. Prayer is not what we should do after we've tried everything that there is to try and we've failed, and now we say, I guess we'll have to pray. I guess we'll have to turn to God. I guess we're going to have to... Let prayer be our answer. What actually Jehoshaphat does, he gets the news, he's terrified. He immediately goes and runs to God and begins to beg God for guidance. And this is so big, this issue is so big that he asks all of Judah to do the same. And he establishes a royal fast that day so that the people would fast and pray. Here is this unexpected, sudden, immediate crisis that occurs and Jehoshaphat immediately prays verse 5 says Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord and he prayed here's what he begins to pray as he goes on and I want to suggest to you that we talk about what I need to do what you need to do in a moment of crisis when we pray is to remember who God is Remember who we're talking to when we pray. And remember what God has already done in our lives or in the lives of others. Remember what he's done and remember what God has said. Read with me as we go on through verse 6 and 7. It says, He prayed, O Lord God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty, and no one can stand against you. Verse 7, O oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in the land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? I want you to notice that what, what Jehoshaphat does as he begins to pray is, first of all, he puts in his mind who he is talking to. God, as he addresses him, he says, God, there is no one like you. You reign in heaven. You are mighty. You are powerful. You are unmatched. No one can stand against you. You are the sovereign Lord. And God, I remember what you did. I remember that when our people came to this land, how you drove out the enemies who were in the land. I, I, I remember, and I know that. And God, I remember what you said. I remember the promise that you made to your friend Abraham that this would be our land. You would give us this land. It would be our land forever, our land. And I remember those things. So what I want to suggest to you is that in a moment of crisis, when you pray, when you turn to God, remember who you're talking to. Remember, we're not talking to a king or a general or a president or a counselor who's wise. We're talking to the sovereign Lord who reigns over all of the earth. And nothing and no one can stand opposed to God. He says, I know who you are. I remember who you are. And remember the things that God has done in your life or the lives of others. Because usually when a crisis occurs, our minds almost go blank. What are we going to do? What will God do? How could we ever get out of this mess? How could we ever fix this? We need to remember what God has done. And the promises that God has made where God said he would never put upon us anything more than we could handle that God would never forsake us, that God would never leave us. We need to remember those things because in a moment of crisis, I need that kind of anchoring, and so do you. Secondly, I would suggest to you that we recount past actions. Look at what it says at verses 8 and 9. 
Verse 8 and 9, your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, verse 9, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us, and you will rescue us. Now, I want you to notice that there, Jehoshaphat is recounting some of what they've done. Lord, you planted us in this land, and then we came together, and we built this temple. We built this temple because this would be the place we would come and, and meet with you. And this is the place where we would come and, and put our lives before you. This is the place that we would pour out our hearts to you. God, this is what we have done. I think you and I need to recount our, our past actions, recount what we have done. Now, I'm not talking about bragging or arrogance. I'm not talking about the, the Pharisee, you remember, and the publican who go down to pray. And the Pharisee, in essence, says, God, you're fortunate to have a guy like me on your team. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about relating to God, letting God know, telling him some of the things you've done, why you've done these things, to try to honor him. Because history is often a component in biblical prayers. That's what they do. The third thing that I would suggest to you is remind God of his character. Look at the next verses. Verses 10 and 11, it says, And now see, see what the armies of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those, invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now listen to verse 11. Now see how they reward us, for they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave to us as an inheritance. I think they're reminding God of his character. Now, you might think reminding God, that's, that's kind of sacrilegious or irreligious to think that you're going to remind God of something. But I want you to know it's not. It, it's filled in the Scriptures, biblical prayers over and over and over. Go to God and say, God, you said this and this and this. And you promise this, and you did, and, and, and they lay this out over and over again, reminding God of his character. And in essence, what Jehoshaphat is saying here is, God, you know, when we left Egypt, we went around those nations. We didn't invade them. And look what they're coming to do to us. They're invading us. They're coming against us and trying to kick us off the land you've given to us. And in essence, they're saying, God, that's not right. That's not fair. God, you are more just than that. And they are appealing to God's character, his justice, or his fairness, and appealing to him in that way. You may remember the prophet Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Habakkuk goes to God, and he, in essence, cries out to him and says, God, I've been telling you about all of these problems that are going on around us, and you haven't done anything. What's, what's going on? And God says, in essence, I've got this. I, I've got it taken care of. But Habakkuk just can't see it. He doesn't know what God is doing. And, and he's telling him, you, you, can't do, you just can't let this go on, God. And the Lord says to Habakkuk, I'm working a work in your day, which if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. And Habakkuk, in essence, says, okay, try me. Go ahead, God. Try me. Give me the news. And God says, I'm going to raise up the Chaldean nation, those Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation. They're going to come and fight against you. They're going to war against you. And Habakkuk's reaction to that is, wait a minute, God, you can't do that. Exactly what God had said would be his reaction. You know, so, so what I want to suggest to you is you might be wrong, and I might be wrong when I remind God of his character and say, God, you can't, you're, you're too fair you're too true, you're too right, you're too just to allow that to, be, to happen. I might be wrong because God may have a greater purpose, like Habakkuk was wrong, but there's nothing wrong with me telling God and reminding God of his character. And then I would suggest to you that what you and I need to do in the most moment of a crisis at verse 12 is to relate our inadequacy before God. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? Now listen, we are powerless against this mighty armor, uh, army that is about to attack us. You, you see, they, they say, God, this is too big for us. 
We need your help. We need your guidance. We need your strength. We are completely inadequate. You see, it is a crisis, and they are overwhelmed. This is not a speed bump in the middle of the road. This is you having to get to the other side of a rushing river during a torrential rain, and the bridge has washed out. This is an emergency. This is a crisis. This is not a Band-Aid. This is radical surgery that you need. And they said, God, we are completely powerless. It's a simple act of dependence and reliance upon God. God, I can't do this on my own. God, I have no idea what to do in this situation. God, I don't have the strength, or I don't have the wisdom, or I don't have the interest, or I don't have the desire even to do this. God, I'm over my head, and I don't know what to do. I need your help because this is a crisis. And then in verse 12, the last statement, where he says, we do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. It's relying on God's help. I want to tell you what, this is the hardest part of prayer. And it's that simple word that's oh so difficult, and that's called trust. To trust God at that moment. Because we're overwhelmed by a crisis, we just completely feel we are outmatched in every regard, and we're saying, God, we can't do anything without you, but we're going to give this to you and trust that you will help us. That's what I need to do. It's what you need to do and how we need to pray during a crisis. Now, let me just finish this up kind of quickly and tell you what goes on in the rest of the story. I'll let you go home and read it this sometime today or this week. But God inspires a man by the name of Jehaziel to tell everyone that everything's going to be okay. Verses 13 to 17, verses 18 and 19, Jehoshaphat accepts God's word. He accepts this prophet as a prophet of God, and he and the people when they get this news, they do the almost unimaginable. They stop and they worship God before the army ever comes marching in. Jehaziel says, it's going to be okay. God's got this thing. You put your trust in God. You rely on him. And the people say, in essence, okay. And they worship God at that moment. Verse 20, as they are now going out the next day or the next time to, to go meet the armies as they come, Jehoshaphat stops and he encourages all the people to trust God and to rest in faith. Look at verse 20. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out to the wilderness of Tekoa as God had directed them. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped them and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you'll be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. And after consulting the people... Verse 21, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him in, for his holy splendor. And this is what they th sang, give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. I want you to picture this. Here is this army that is coming to march against you that just a few moments before you said, we can't do this. And now God has inspired a prophet to say, it's going to be okay. And they march forward singing a song of victory before the battle has even been begun. Now that's faith, that's courage, that's strength. Verses 22 to 30, God turns that battle into a blessing and as the promise had been made you won't even have to lift a finger you won't have to go fight these enemy armies turn on one another and begin to fight one another and kill one another until the people of Judah get to the point of the lookout and they look out and all they see is a is a whole place full of dead men who have come out for battle who have fought and killed one another and they have so much plunder, it takes them several days to gather it all up and carry it back home. God turned their battle into a blessing. 
How do you pray in a time of crisis? What do we do? We remember who God is. We remember what He has said. We remember what He's done, recounting our past actions, reminding God of His character, relating our need for Him, our own inadequacy, and relying on His help. And God delivers in a mighty way. Now, let me close by saying this. I wish, I wish that I could tell you that no matter what crisis comes in your life, it'll all work out just like it did for Jehoshaphat. You won't have to lift a finger. You won't have to fight. You just pray this prayer, pray like this, and everything's going to work out perfectly for you. But I can't promise that. I can't promise that you won't have to lift a finger. I can't, I, I, I can't even promise you that you're going to be okay as far as this physical life is concerned. But here is what I can promise you, and that is that your prayer will be heard and that God will see, God will hear, and God will know. This is a biblical example of how to pray in a moment, in a time of crisis. And I want to suggest to you this morning, if you are one of God's children, that your prayer will be heard and that God will act in the very best way. And he may just amaze you like he did Jehoshaphat if we put our trust and our confidence there. Would you bow with me as we close this part with prayer? Oh, Lord God of our fathers, you and you alone are the true God of heaven. You are the creator of this world, and you keep it going every day. You are El Shaddai, God Almighty, and no one and nothing can stop you or stand against you, for you are God Most High. Lord, it was nearly 250 years ago that brave men and women endeavored to establish a nation that allowed them to worship you without governmental intrusion. They succeeded against unimaginable odds because you were with them. And you have amazingly blessed this country over and over again ever since. We have survived two world wars, the Spanish flu, racial injustice, Republicans in office, Democrats in office, and countless other challenges that you have carried us through lord you have said in your word that you want us and you would like for us to live quiet and peaceable lives in this world and to affect it for change by trying to lead people to you so lord we're asking you to bless us and to bless this nation again we pray that this pandemic and the multiple fears that it has created will drive us to our knees and bring us closer to you and, Lord, we're trying to walk in the steps that you've laid out for us, and we're trying to show others the way. So please open doors for us to share your word. And, Lord, we beg you that men and women will rise up and let their voices be heard and that you will help us. Help us to elect men and women of character, men and women of courage, men and women of faith who will help us to draw closer to you instead of further away God with this pandemic with the turmoil in our streets with the stresses and the strains on our economy and with the political fighting and name calling and accusations Lord we are admitting we can't do this without you it's bigger than Market Street it's bigger than Salem it's bigger than Oregon it's bigger than this nation and not a one of us can do this on our own and so we need your help Lord please intervene and please bring healing and father finally we put our trust in you because we know yes we know that you reign supreme and that you will do what is best and so we offer this prayer to you in the name of jesus and let the congregation say amen i don't know what your condition is before the lord but I do know that with God on your side, you'll never lose. And so we're going to extend to you God's invitation. If there's some way that we could serve you, 
by allowing you, ushering you, helping you into the kingdom of God or to come back to him. Would you let us know while we sing? Father, I do sin, and my heart breaks deep within. For you have sought me, yet I turn away from all your loving care. So often do I fall, yet you reach out again, lifting my burden that is more than I can ever bear. My broken, contrite heart is so worthless in my sight. But you restore it, give it peace and joy to love and follow you. Oh, may I ever strive to live pure in your sight, filled with your goodness, free to glorify and honor you. Through your beloved Son, there is grace so undeserved. How can I ever sin against the one who makes my heart to sing? Create a heart so clean that like you I may be as light of morning who rises up with healing in its wings. Thank you, Brother Broyles. Much appreciated. Do the elders have anything else they'd like announced this morning? Not seeing anything, we'll ask Brother Chris Huntley to lead us in a closing word of prayer, and then please wait to be dismissed. Let's all bow together. Our Father in heaven, you are holy, so separated from all the taint that has happened to your creation that at one time was very good and then sin has entered in and boy we've joined with it uh, we've become a part of that we have uh, done our part as well and yet even so you still are god you still are enthroned above all you still are the creator of all. You are the one who makes what is wrong right, what is impure, pure, what is tainted, clean. And we recognize you now as our God, sovereign of all. And we remember now what you have done throughout your your word throughout the, the life of this world, this existence, how you have been there from the very beginning. You've never stepped away. You've never turned your eye. You've never just thrown in the towel and looked at us as mankind and messing everything up and, and just said, forget it. 
I'm just going to destroy everything completely. But that even in the darkest moments, you still have always given hope. You still have always given grace. And you have told us that you will never leave us. You'll never forsake us. You'll never abandon us. And that we will always have that hope. And that's why we remember what you have done for the people of old. Even from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, how you've taken care of them. You've given hope through Noah. You've created a path for righteousness that begins through Abraham, through the people of Israel, as was talked about today, that you were there, you have shown through how you treated them, how you treat your people. And even today, we know the incredible grace that you've provided for each of us in our lives, the ultimate grace through your son, but even just the help in our lives as we look back on our struggles, problems, foibles, issues that we face. We recognize you've always been there. You always help us. You are our God. Which is why as we are facing difficulties right now, uh, stresses, problems, division that takes place over whether to listen to the government or not, wear face masks, don't wear face masks, and who knows what else is coming in the next few weeks, this is bigger than us. Um, this is more than what we're able to handle ourselves, which is why we implore you now to remember who you are as you spoke to Moses, as you said your character, that you said you are merciful and gracious, that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, and that you keep that love for the thousands of generations, and that you forgive iniquity, you forgive transgression, you forgive sin, you still hold people accountable, you visit the iniquity on, of the fathers to the children, the children's children, but only to the third or fourth generation in comparison to the love that extends forever. Remember, God, that is who you are, Give us now that same hope. Give us now a peace that passes understanding. Give us now the peace that comes through your Son who said to us, Come all who are weary, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Please, God, in the midst of all of this, give us your rest. Give us your peace. We thank you because we know that you hear us that you listen, and that you care. And most importantly, that you love us because we have seen that love as we look to the cross. We thank you for Jesus who gives us a, a hope that certainly is, is beyond what we deserve. It's, it's beyond what we could have even imagined. But it's a hope that we relish in. We love you for it, we thank you for it, and we look forward to spending eternity in a place where there are no more problems with you. We thank you so much for Jesus, and it's through the incredible name of Jesus we pray now. Amen.